So if you see here, week nine presentations, this has got a whole lot of links, which you probably will find quite valuable. I'm going to use one or two of the links now, and then there's a whole lot of other links in a document that you can see there, the Word document, which has lots and lots of links to storytelling, to how to give presentations, things that don't work terribly well, uh, which cause confusion. And a lovely selection here, um, particularly this set here, the LinkedIn ones from Shane Snow. These are all free vi videos which you can actually get access to even if you don't have a LinkedIn account. And Shane is a very good speaker and he talks very clearly about a whole range of very, very important aspects of giving presentations in front of large audiences or small audiences. And there's an exercise built into here, linked to last week's activities in terms of being a great student, in, in terms of being a great employee, and, terms, and the things and the skills that you need to learn and develop. And then some ideas that I've gained over the last <clears throat> long time, about, well, since 1985 or thereabouts, when I went on a, the first course uh, about giving presentations, which was very much hands-on, and then we got a critique afterwards. So I'll build some of those ideas in, and I've picked them up from a whole lot of other sources as well. So it's not just my experience, it's other things. So the context of what I would like you to practice doing and how you produce the presentation is entirely up to you, and I'll show you a couple of different uh, approaches. And I'd like you to think about this topic. What have you already learned about how to be an excellent, high-achieving student? So let's think about that context. Think about the preparation. How you go around that sort of random walk, that red butterfly flight for your research and then convert that into a good structure along that golden arrow that, that you've seen earlier on. The golden arrow that shows you how to get from the beginning, the introduction, all the way through in a logical sort of, uh, linear progression that takes you and the, your audience <coughs> to that final powerful conclusion that they are going to remember. So you start off, in terms of a presentation, you would always want to have a nice, simple, clear title page that just identifies the topic and your name, and maybe in the footer, the organisation that you work for. For me, University of Derby. You then might want to have a single sheet, one slide, about the context. Not very many bullet points, not very much text. Because you don't want the, your audience to spend time, or a lot of time, reading the text when they should be listening to you, to listen to that story that you are telling. So a nice, simple, clear introduction context sheet. It may well be valuable to have another sheet which identifies the aim of your talk. Maybe it even has a couple of uh, objectives to focus them on what they're going to learn. You have seen just two bullets on the context introduction sheet on this uh, slide. And then you'll have a few slides which will capture a very simple version of the different little topics, the subtopics that you're going to cover. And then at the end you have the conclusion. 
This is where we have got in terms of this presentation. It's kind of around the idea of this is what I'm going to tell you. Now I'm telling you. And then a reminder, this is what I told you. Introduction, this is what I'm going to tell you. A few slides, this is what I this is me telling you. And then one slide. This is what I told you. So you kind, of, can, you kind of remember better what the whole thing was about. You remember we talked about those four critical questions. About what I need to or what I want to say. I want to say lots and lots and lots. But critically, these are the few, four maybe, items that I really, really must talk about. Narrowing down. And you've all done that over the last two or three weeks. As you found you'd written in your ordinary Word document, two or three, four pages, put it into LNCS format. Oh, it's more than three pages. Now I've got to really, really concentrate on what is that critical need to in terms of that article. Bring it back down to that three pages. And the same will go with all of those four questions. <coughs> Little amplification of the, the different ones. This is part of your planning down the golden arrow. Narrowing it down to those three or four or maybe five critical topics. Remembering in a presentation you've got that difference between an approach between informing people these are great ideas, this is cool, or persuading them to do something. And one of the most powerful of the questions is a third bullet point. Do I need to say it at all? Now in other contexts, you will hear me talk about, so what? And the purpose of that is not to be rude, but it is to remind you to think about the question of, yeah, why have I put it there? Is it just interesting? Or is it part of that persuasion, the demonstration of the linkages, the critical analysis, the creation of a synthesis of different ideas into your unique perspective based on logic and evidence? Oops, sorry. <coughs> So, so what do I need to say it at all? Because you have to remember that people, humans, kind of like random information that allows them to dive down interesting and fun rabbit holes. It's a kind of a break from the hard brain ache of following a complex chain of logic. And sometimes we like to find these random items that take us over there. Kind of related, but much more fun. But that will divert your audience from staying with you. And you want to keep control of your audience's attention at all times. So that's why, so what, is such a powerful question. Does it, is it relevant? Does it move the argument, the persuasion, the story, further on down that golden arrow. And so what helps you, if necessary, to cut it down to that time or page or word limit that you have to meet? It is absolutely vital that you have a for any form of communication, a perspective, a view on what your aim is for the presentation, the assignment, the article, or even just a conversation. 
Where am I trying to go? Where am I trying to take my listeners with this particular conversation or story? So that helps you to think about why do I want to say it? Why do I need to say it? And to concentrate on the need to ideas. I'll keep re reinforcing these ideas because as humans, we tend not to listen terribly well. We tend <coughs> to forget. We tend only to hear and see things that we are particularly interested in. So we have to be very clear about that need to and make sure that message comes across very, very clearly. And it provides that connection from the previous slide about the what and do I want to, what do I need to say. And gives you the why. <coughs> now, one of the little videos I'm going to show you in a little bit will talk about knowing your audience and just how incredibly important it is <coughs> to understand the nature of your audience, their background, their interests, and what they <coughs> want to get out of your talk. You see, as an example, if, if I'm giving a, a, been asked by a conference organiser to give a talk, and let's take the couple of talks I gave over about two and four weeks ago. One up in York, one down in London. One group was very, very interested in software testing as a profession as the, the thing that they were knowledgeable about. The other group were chief data officers, chief scientific officers, uh, chief information officers and so on in financial services organisations. And I was wanting to get, ultimately, the same message to them about how we could design, uh, create, and test and validate our IT-based systems. But I had to angle both the title and the little abstract for those two presentations quite, quite differently in order to catch the attention of two very, very different types of organisations. One group who were particularly interested in more detailed information about the whole process. Others, much, much more senior typically, who I needed to get to think about the broad process at a much higher level. So I had to think about what their backgrounds were, what their day-to-day -day jobs were, what sort of language they were actually familiar with. And that has a huge effect on how you construct a presentation and how you then deliver it. You need to think about what do they already know, what do they, you need to brief them with as an introduction in terms of definitions. Now, in terms of this little presentation I would like you to think about creating as a practice event, I want to give you six to eight slides, which means you've got three or four slides as the body of your presentation about what have you learned about being a great learner. <coughs> as a guideline, each slide in a presentation of the main body provides a context for something like between two and five minutes of you telling the story. You educating or persuading your audience. And as you plan out a presentation, you may be given, you'll be given a set amount of time. You normally will want them 
particularly when you're starting, you'll want to get the, the audience to hold their questions until the end, so as not to derail your thoughts and your thought processes. So you'll want to leave a short amount of time, maybe two to five minutes at the end of your presentation, for questions. Now, as you get more experience in giving presentations, you will become quite happy to have people putting their hand up in the middle of a presentation to ask questions. But you'll want to have had some experience in giving presentations, otherwise you'll find questions in the middle a little bit disruptive, they'll throw you off your train of thought, you won't remember where you want to be. So the amount of time you have got will drive the number of slides in your presentation. And what you will realise is that if you're using slides like this, with two or three bullet points and text at, I think this is about 18 point, you're not going to be able to last very long if you turn around and read how much time do I have need to say it? Mm. Topics are, well, you've got six to eight slides, two to five minutes per slide, remember to leave some time for questions, 15 seconds. Um, the point I'm making, slides, whether they're PowerPoint, Prezi, PDFs of Word documents or whatever, for presentation, they are not your script. Your script will be, maybe, if you have to have a complete script, it will be on a Word document. If you're at a big conference, you may have an auto cue set over there that you read carefully. Or like we saw a couple of weeks ago with Ginny Rometty from IBM, she had a sort of, yes, she did have the auto prompt there, but it was small text and it didn't move. She wasn't reading it, it was just her, effectively, her 3x4 card, or 4x3 card, over there so she could make sure she covered the most important points. For you, that is just a simple summary of the critical points that, that I'm going to be talking about, or that I have just, in this instance, just talked about. This and the next one or two slides are really quite important in terms of the use of space on your slides. The slides must be really, really simple. Your audience ought to be able to read them in about five seconds as it flashes up on the screen. One line per idea, like on here, and it's probably actually 24 point or 28 point text. That's going to keep you to a very few words, it can be read easily. The point is, you've got to read it quickly as an audience and then you should be able to listen. And as you listen, you're thinking about what is being said there and connecting it to other things that you already know. Whether here in the context of, hmm, I saw a presentation a day or two ago where it was, the, the text was half the size of that and there were 10 or 12 lines of text, very, very small text. And the presenter stood here and read every single word. And so you should then be thinking, which is better for me? Do I really want to have a to create a presentation, a couple of hundred words on it that I can read, it gives me the whole script, and then I read it, in a very boring slides or signpost to your talk. 
keep the slides simple, four to five bullet points per slide, one line per idea, 24, 28 point font, audience need to read fast, framework for the next five minutes. You know, when, if I were to do that, you would say, Richard, what on earth are you doing? Your voice is monotone, you're boring. I can read that, why bother to read it yourself as a presenter? Have you been there? Yes. <laughs> I remember one, one conference I went to, and the keynote address, and this was for a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary con uh, conference, where we had lecturers, academics, and PhD researchers and others all come together to talk about, about their own little things. And the keynote address was very, very topical. It was about the local history around the city where the conference was being held. And we thought, wow, we'll learn something really great about the Toronto district, about its local history. We'll find out some fun stuff. And I think that the conference organiser had thought that that was going to be the case. And this, remember, is the first presentation to the whole conference that everybody was there, 100 or 200 people. And then, the paper, the keynote address, was read from six pages of typed, small typescript in an amazingly monotone voice. I'm not good at monotone, so I can't quite replicate it. And you could see all of the audience going, <laughs> why are we here? <coughs> What is this telling us about the conference, about Toronto? So keep it really simple on your slides. If you do have to have that crib, please don't read it. Because what the natural impact or effect is we will go much closer to monotone and bore the audience to death. Now, if we're using things like Prezi, PowerPoint, and the other open source varieties from Open uh, Office and so on, they have a magical, a wonderful range, a range of special effects. You can get each bullet point to appear when you press the little button. You can get them to fly in from the left and from the right. You can come down from the top and from the bottom. You can get whole slides to come across and open up. And by the time you've done that, you've shown that you know every possible special effect in your thing, in your, PowerPoint, in your presentation system. Do we as an audience care two hoots as to whether you are an ace at special effects? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> How many of you have seen Presley presentations? I'll show you one, everybody else who's not seen one, so you can kind of see what it's like. <clears throat> However, the reality is, and if you go on sort of professional courses for giving effective presentations, one of the critical messages they give is do not use special effects without an extremely good reason. They cause confusion, they cause irritation. They can even cause seasickness or motion sickness effects. Don't fly in each bullet point as you come to it. Because normally your slide will cover a single topic and those three or four bullet points really all need to be there because they provide that basis for the two to five minute story. There are, however, a few occasions when it is appropriate to bring them in one by one, but not very often. Try to reduce the use of special effects as much as possible.
Before you start creating presentations, go look for good advice. Use Google to find lots of good advice. There are a fantastic range of resources out there that show you really great examples of good presentations and some stunningly good examples of very, very bad presentations. They're worth having a look at. Use Google, use YouTube, use LinkedIn, use TED Talks. There's some magical ones. I'm going to give you a list, of, a sort of set of resources, which will help you to find really good advice. Get it and understand it and apply it. You see, there's no point in just re finding it and saying, oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, I won't bother. I'll carry on and I'll do whatever I think I want to do because you might not end up giving a good presentation. Well, in fact, I'll guarantee almost certainly you won't do a good presentation. I think we might just have a little look, if we can, at this one, if it works. This is one of the, one of the sources that I gave. Oh, and the last one here, <laughs> Faith in Modern Technology. I've got it on a memory stick. Ah, it doesn't open. In fact, it's not even recognised by this PC. I wonder why. Have you got it on another device? Never go to a presentation with it in one place only. I think I mentioned a problem a few weeks ago where I was trying, about to give a presentation to the chief exec of the division I worked in. Uh, this is back in 85 or 6. And we had got a beautiful PowerPoint presentation set up giving examples of how our wonderful new system was using the beautiful new colour graphics and printer systems that we'd uh, paid a fortune for. The problem with technology is the likelihood of it breaking is almost directly proportional to the importance of the presentation. If you're giving it to a colleague, it'll probably work. If you're giving it to a chief exec, it'll probably break. If you're giving it to a public presentation of chief information officers and chief data officers, it'll probably break. And, in fact, the joke of it was, that presentation up in York to a whole load of these test engineers, I hadn't used my laptop for a week or three, fired it up, got it running, and halfway through the presentation, suddenly decided to do the Windows update. <laughs> I think I've learned a lesson there. Fire the PC up the night before, leave it running for half an hour, and things will happen, it will do its thing. Because it's kind of embarrassing, you know, you suddenly lost your presentation for five minutes while it kind of does things, and reboots itself, and then does the Windows update, 15%, 20%, you know. So have a look at that, that article, that web page, it's got some really great <coughs> advice. Not only use the internet and the YouTube videos, the TED Talks and so on, but also look for other sources of advice. You'll find lots of advice about how to create good presentations on almost every single university in the UK, and I suspect even from here, I haven't looked at it uh, particularly. So, you've now thought about it, you've thought about the techniques you're going to use, you understand the techniques you're definitely not going to use. Now, let's go about it. Like your article, your presentation needs a nice, short, snappy title that pretty much covers the topic, so the audience know what it's going to be about.
In the context or the introduction, you might identify also the two or three or four critical points within the presentation. And so you will probably have a page for each of those key points. And then you'll fill in your three or four points for each of those pages. But the important point for most presentations is going to be that final conclusions page. This is what I've told you, the most important things. Now in terms of background, I use this particular style, which in uh, PowerPoint, I think this, yeah, this one is called Streams, which normally has white on this royal blue. However, many, many, many years ago, when I first started giving presentations, one, and we first started using um, slides like this, not necessarily on a projector like that, but an ordinary overhead projector in a darkened room. And one of the points that the experts told me was, if you are looking at avoiding eye strain and tiredness, you want to choose a colour combination which is comparatively low contrast, not too low contrast, but not too high, and also avoids the problem of colourblind people. You do not want to have a lovely red on top of that. Otherwise, you have a big problem, the eye is trying to focus the light from the screen at two different points on your retina. One on the, on the retina and one behind it or in front. And if you, I'll just change this for you, just so you can see what happens. It's quite interesting. Now, some people will find that difficult to read because they're, uh, particularly some blokes are red-blue are, are red, colourblind. The rest of you who are not colourblind will find that the red is hovering in front or behind, isn't it? Really, really disruptive. Now, whether you're using a, a black background like that, or whether you are, and if I go back to that, We've got there probably the worst possible contrast you can get in terms of uh, bright and, and dark. The black text on white background is again very, very difficult for the audience to watch for a long period of time. You get, your eyes get very, very tired. Now, the other thing that people tend to do people like to do is to find lots of lovely different backgrounds. And I remember one occasion, the context was such that the student who was presenting it, making this presentation, thought, I, I really want to have a beautiful picture. And it was a gorgeous picture of a red, beautiful dragon on a white background. As a background, it was stunning and very good in the context of what the presentation was about. There was only one problem, but it was kind of a fatal problem. You couldn't see or read the text that was overlaid on the background. <coughs> it was a disaster, so have a, have a look and check it. The other thing that's important is that if you want your audience, or 95% of your audience, to read your slide quickly, you need to use a, what we call a serif font. Times New Roman, Garamond, 
something like that. Or she really wanted to read it very, very fast and comprehend it quickly and don't care about how it looks, use Courier. Courier is the most easy to read font in the world for Westerners. It's the easiest font to comprehend, except it looks awful. But Garamond, Times New Roman are pretty good. Yeah, I said don't use special effects, but I said there may be an opportunity when it's worthwhile. Try them out on yourself and on some friends. See what works, see what doesn't work. Are you trying to show how clever you are at presenting or creating a presentation? Or are you actually trying to be persuasive? What are you trying to do? One of the most important points is don't rush. Because when we're nervous, our speech speeds up. We can talk, if we're getting excited or getting nervous, 120, 150, 200 words a minute. But it becomes difficult to understand. So practice, get confidence, and speak comparatively slowly. <coughs> talk to your audience. Try and make contact with almost everybody in the room. Make sure you search out their eyes. See how they are responding. Don't, and the most important, one of the most important things is don't turn your back on the audience. And how many times do you see presenters standing and talking to that? What message does it give to the audience if I'm standing around like that? Or even just talk, standing there and looking at that while I'm talking, kind of, well, where am I talking to? How am I communicating? You'll find more in Lowe's, Peters and Turner. There's a nice chapter in there about communicating and about giving presentations. So that's the end of the, this presentation. Now I'm going to switch that off because I don't want to video these other videos I'm going to show you.